All right, well, good morning, church family. It got pretty rowdy during worship. That was awesome. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, you keep up the excitement and energy while you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. As we continue our walk through our fall sermon series, walking through the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, Let me remind you at the conclusion of today's service, uh, we are going to uh, take a survey together that I announced uh, a couple weeks ago in regard to our legacy campaign, okay? So uh, be looking forward to that. Uh, That means we got to get moving on our sermon series, all right? 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. You can make that your own so that you have a copy of God's Word. Now, let me remind you of our context in 1 Timothy uh, before I read our passage. So, false teachers have risen up in the church in Ephesus, and they are teaching an inward, exclusive gospel, a gospel of French theology and legalistic rules. All right, they do not teach that the gospel is an open call. Come one, come all. Rather, they exclude the call of salvation for the elite, the enlightened few. Now, Paul writes to Timothy to tell him to specifically deal with these false teachers, but he is also simultaneously charging the church, the congregation as a whole. Remember last week uh, in chapter one, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Guys, Mark did an incredible job leading us through that passage uh, last week. Let me remind you, right? If, if, If Christ could save Paul, who hated and persecuted the church, then Christ can save anyone. And if Christ would then take that same Paul and put him into service and use him mightily for the kingdom, then God is calling each and every one of us to be used in his kingdom as well. All right, with that reminder, now we are ready to hear what Paul is gonna say next to the church Continuing this theme that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But now listen to what he says because it involves you and I as a church, as a congregation, as individuals praying for the lost people in our lives. 1 Timothy chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, as a congregation that has gathered to hear from you, Father, we pray that we would be so charged and so encouraged at the way that your word teaches us to pray to you, to come before your throne, lift up petitions that are good and right and godly, knowing that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you hear us, that we have access to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is from eternity past, 
that you hear us and you call us your own. Father, I pray that we are so charged and encouraged this morning to pray for the lost people in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, it was at the uh, 1793 Baptist Missionary Society in London that the Lord moved in a powerful, unique way. Let me set up the scene. William Carey, the, uh, the, the Baptist missionary, was alone in India, very discouraged because he was just kind of off on his own. And he had two friends, Andrew Fuller and John Ryland, who were at this uh, Baptist Missionary Society in London. It was a conference, and they had gathered together, and John Ryland began to preach. And in the middle of that sermon, he begins to, to talk about his friend Carrie, who is alone and isolated in India and is discouraged. But during that sermon, Ryland began to mention that uh, Carrie had three sons, two of which were saved and were involved in missions and in the ministry, but that he had a third son, Jabez, who was lost. And Ryland, during that conference, just became overwhelmed as he was speaking about the plight of his friend, Carrie. And in a moment of desperation before the crowd, he called out and he said, guys, would you stand and pray with me right now for Carrie's son, Jabez, that he would come to saving faith and in a Holy Spirit empowered moment, 2,000 in that congregation there together in unison lifted up Jabez's name before the throne of God. Well, wouldn't you know it, shortly after that, a letter came back from Kerry stating that his son had come to faith. And when they went back and did the timeline, it was linked to that very moment, there at that conference, when the people of God prayed, called before the throne of God Almighty on Jabez's name, that he came to faith. So with that, listen to me and and listen to Paul's instructions as he says, church, I urge you, Pray on behalf of all men. Pray on behalf of all men. I want you to picture with me, uh, I I want to paint in your mind the picture that the author of Hebrews gives us about prayer. Begin in your mind that God is on his throne, but he's not on an earthly throne He's not in a temple made with hands. He is in the heavenly throne, seated on the heavenly throne. And there you are entering in those doors into his presence. And Jesus sits at the Father's right hand. And as you enter, Jesus calls out, Father, this one is mine. Do not be afraid. Come in, my child, for I have compassion and patience and mercy for you. I understand your weaknesses and your limitations. What do you need, my child? That is the magnificent picture of prayer. And here, Paul specifically urges us, in that scene, you say their name before God Almighty. Say whose name? All men. The people that God has placed in your life. Use our access to cry before God's throne for their salvation. Here, Paul actually uses four words that work together in secession about prayer, entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings. 
And what he is saying, picture in your mind, you enter in before the throne of God Almighty and begin to make a request to plead their name before God and to be thankful for who they are in God's image and cry out for their salvation. Oh, how often, guys, prayer is an afterthought or a last resort, right? When we have done everything else that we know to do, when we have exhausted all of our resources, then we say, well, I guess it's time to pray. And especially when it comes to people, it's like we think prayer is a last second Hail Mary. Notice here that prayer is not a last minute stopgap. It is where we start. It is how we love people. It is how we are called to reach an outside world and shine the light of the gospel. You see, if Christ came to save sinners, then there is one thing that the church must be about, praying for sinners to come to salvation. That is in your personal life and when we gather together corporately. And I'm just going to tell you guys, as I've been preparing to preach this sermon, the Lord has convicted me specifically about leading us more in times of prayer together, especially for the lost in our lives. And I'm giving you a promise that what you're going to see from this point moving forward, that we are going to be even more intentional about praying for the lost in our lives. Because there is a power when we gather together, a uniqueness. The scripture calls us the temple of God, the body of Christ. Now, I don't have time to unpack the mystery of prayer for you this morning, but I I wanna petition you from God's word how scripture implores us to be about prayer. To be about prayer. In in Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus looked out at the crowds and he felt compassion. Then he says to his disciples that the fields and the harvest is ripe and ready, but the workers are few. And then he commands his disciples, pray that God would send more workers into the harvest. I want you to pause and think about what I just said. Because the Son of God is standing on earth and he sees a problem. And what he says to his disciples, do you want to know what the answer is? That when my disciples see the urgency that I see and then petition the Father to do something about it. Jesus didn't wave a magic wand or give some other solution. The solution that he gave was that the people of God would have urgency and pray before God. Let me give you one other scriptural example. In Ezekiel chapter 22, there is an illustration uh, that God uses as a picture of, you know how there's a wall around ancient cities that was protection, He says, imagine that there is a breach in the wall, a hole in the wall. Now, in ancient times, if you had a hole in the wall, obviously that is where the enemies are going to get in. And so what armies would strategically do would be stand in the breach, stand in the gap. You must protect that until it gets rebuilt. So here's the illustration. God says there is a breach in the wall of Jerusalem or with his people. And the army that is coming or the wave that is coming is the judgment that the people of God deserve for their wickedness. And here in Ezekiel chapter 22, God says, I was looking down. The people deserved judgment because they had wandered from me. But I was looking from heaven and I was looking and hoping that there might be someone who was standing in the gap and pleading for mercy for my people. But I found none, no one willing to stand in the gap, and so my judgment is coming. Now, that is an incredible picture 
in terms of not only God's justice that must be poured out, but also the part of God who says, I was looking if there might be someone to stand in the gap and plead for mercy for my people. Are we going to be those people who stand in the gap? Now, right on the heels of urging the church to pray for all men, Paul specifically mentions, look at verse 2, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. You say, but in Paul's day, there were no Christian kings. In fact, those who were in authority hated Christianity. They persecuted the church. They were downright evil. The reigning Caesar was one of the worst in all of history. The infamous Nero, who used Christians as sport in the Colosseum games, feeding them to the lions, who was so demonically mad that he took Christians, tarred them, hung them up on poles, lit them on fire for lights during one of the festivals that he had at his house. That is who Nero was. Yes, that is the context that Paul writes that the church must pray for kings and for all those in authority. See, because good government is a gift of God's common grace, that there would be justice and peace and thanksgiving for all the good that we have as a nation. And he specifically prays that the government would allow the church the freedom to be, to live a tranquil and quiet life without persecution, the freedom to assemble together and to go about kingdom work. You know what Paul would write for us today? that we would specifically pray for President Biden and for all of those in authority. That he would allow us to lead a tranquil and quiet life. That we would pray that President Biden would have godly wisdom, that he would be surrounded by godly counsel. You know, John Christman once said, no one can feel hatred towards those for whom he prays because prayer replaces hostility with compassion. Christians who do not pray for their leaders tend to become cynical and rejoice at calamity and even go as so far as to disturb the peace. So let me ask you, beloved, what are you doing with your political frustrations? Complaining or praying? Worrying or praying? Watching endless cable news cycles or praying? Have you so exercised your right for free speech that it has replaced you exercising your right to pray? So I want us right now, I want you to stand to your feet because I think you'll do better if you stand to your feet. I want us as a congregation to pray for our president, to pray for Kamala Harris and former President Trump, realizing that in our nation, one of those is going to be the most powerful person on the planet. And we are going to petition God Almighty, right now, come together in Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we lift up our leaders. And we pray that you would give them wisdom. That your spirit would speak to them and that you would surround them with godly counsel. And that they would be able to hear your voice. Father, I pray that you would expose their pride Show them that they need you, that they need a dependence upon you, God. Show them the limitations that they have, God, and bring bring your voice around them, God, to lead them 
so that they might see, God, that they might walk with you. Oh, God, I pray that they would walk with you. I pray that they would know you. I pray that you would stir up a hunger for for you in their heart, that they would know you and walk with you and have godly counsel and be able to lead our nation with your wisdom in peace and in justice, God. And Father, we pray right now, standing in the gap for our nation, knowing, God, that we are a nation who is continually turning from you. And Father, if you gave us your justice, if you gave us the judgment that we deserve, God, it would overwhelm us. But we are standing in the gap for our nation and praying, God, that you would give us mercy. We pray that the name of Jesus would be high and lifted up, that there would be a revival in the land, that men and women, young and old, would turn and see the goodness of Jesus Christ, see that there is salvation in one name under heaven and would come to you and would repent, would fall on their faces. And Father, that we would see your kingdom come in our nation right here. And we as your people are willing to do our part part and surrender. We say your will be done. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. All right, so turn your attention back to our text. Because even though Paul specifically mentions kings and those in authority, do not lose sight That the main focus, the urging of the prayer, has one singular focus, that all men would come to know Jesus as their Savior, that all men can and should be saved. Let's reread verses three through seven. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Look with me back at verse four, because that's an incredible verse, guys. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is his son, Jesus Christ. You see, you never have to wonder if God desires for someone to be saved. You will never come before the throne of God in the name of Jesus and and lift up your loved one as this passage urges and hear, I'm sorry, I do not desire for that one to be saved. You will never hear that because God desires all men to be saved. You say, if it is God's will for all to be saved, then are you saying that all will be saved? No, beloved. It is important to understand the difference between God's preferential will and God's sovereign will. God's preferential will is what is pleasing to him, what he desires, what is preferable to him. For example, God desires that you would abide in Christ. So you will never be in a situation where you have to wonder and say, does God want me to use his spirit in this situation? Or does he want me to just kind of do this one on my own? You never have to wonder that. Abide in Christ. Now God's sovereign will is what will come to be. So for example, God will be glorified his sovereign will. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But either you will do that by force or you you will do that through the freedom of salvation. It is God's preferential will, his desire 
that you would come to him through Jesus Christ and be, he would be glorified by his mercy and not his wrath. God desires all to come to faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and for them not to die apart from Jesus in their sin. Ezekiel 31, 11 says, as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked will turn from his way and live. You never have to wonder if the gospel invitation is for him or for her. Maybe they're too far gone. Maybe they're too much a sinner. Absolutely not. Come, all, all men, no matter how vile, may come. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. You never have to wonder if Jesus gave his life for someone. Jesus, when you died, did you die for me? He gave his life as a ransom for all. For all who come, the answer is always yes. Come and see. It's not like at the airport, you know how you're trying to get through the line and the TSA agent may pull someone out to the side Check them over. It's not like you're trying to come to Jesus and, and, and someone's going to put, sir, I'm sorry, you cannot come. Jesus did not die for you. Come over here. Absolutely not. Come. Come one. Come all. The call is for everyone to find life at the foot of the cross. You see, Jesus died for peasants and tycoons, for the middle class and for immigrants, for the uneducated and those with a PhD, for blue collar and white collar, for Americans and Iranians. And you never have to wonder if a group of people is worthy of you answering the call to go. Because God has already said in his word that every tribe, every tongue, and every nation will be gathered around his throne singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. So when Adoniram Judson is seven years in Burma with no converts, he doesn't have to stop and wonder and say, God, maybe there's none in this tribe or this nation that you wish to save. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. He gave his life as a ransom for all. You see, here is Christianity at its widest and its most narrow. For there is only one mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus. And as Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. Or in Acts 14, 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You see, there's an urgency of an exclusive faith. You must come to Jesus. But there's a passion of an inclusive call. Go to the ends of the earth. Tell everyone that you can find. Come, find life in Jesus Christ. Our very own Kathy Meadows came to faith as a little girl. Now her mother had her in church every time the doors were open. But her father, J.W. Carpenter, never darkened the doors. Now, all through the years, Kathy prayed for her father to come to faith. You know what I'm talking about, the love and passion that she had in Jesus. She desired for her own father to know. So she spoke to him every chance she got, every chance telling stories of the amazing things that God was doing on the mission field because Kathy and Mike became missionaries 
or in their personal life. Every chance she got, she would share with her father. But it seemed to no avail. It seemed like her father's heart was so hardened. Even as he faced life-threatening disease. Right? That's the time she prayed the most. But there wasn't even a hint that his heart was softened. So eventually, Kathy gave up hope. She stopped praying for her father's salvation, assuming that he had just refused the Spirit's call. But one day, shortly after she had succumbed to the discouragement, she received a phone call from a few church ladies where her father lived who said that they too were praying for her father. They had heard that she was discouraged and they called her and they said, listen, we're not giving up and you're not giving up. Now, oddly, for the first time, her father began to discuss spiritual things. He even called to ask her, are there any good TV preachers that I should be listening to? Now, a few weeks later, a children's Sunday school department took a field trip to Mr. Carpenter's house. And they had prepared their own illustrated book about coming to faith in Jesus. And the whole little Sunday school class came and presented it and left it with him. It was a couple days later that another church member came by and met with him. And catch this, it was then, two months before his death, that J.W. Carpenter Kathy's father gave his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. Church, we can never stop praying for our loved ones and the people that God has put in our lives. We can never stop praying. And you may be here this morning, and you may be like Kathy. You may be discouraged. You may come to the end of your line and you are in need of a church family and friends that will come alongside and will pray with you, that will hold up your arms when they feel weak and and that like you can't go on. So I'm gonna end our service in a unique way this morning. The praise team's gonna come and lead us in a final song. We'll have uh, a prayer team down here at the front. The church family, How can we not, in response to this text, cry out for the lost in our lives? No reservations, right? We're not here to play church. We are here to cry out for the lost, for your loved ones together, okay? And we are just going to pour out our heart and our lives. So I want you to stand right now, if you would. You may be here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ. Guess what? Today is the day of salvation. Come, come. You may want to use this, these steps as an altar to pour out your heart in expression as you cry out for your loved ones. I would love to pray with you, to be an aid in that. Our prayer team partners would love to come alongside and to cry out their name with you. Let us not be shy. Let us do what God's word has said. Let us cry out for the lost.